for the number two pick in the first round of the 86 draft. And here's the commissioner, David Stern. The Boston Celtics select Len Bias of the University of Maryland. There he is, Len Bias. Well, first of all, Len was just, I told you, he played um, the little intramural football, and then they started on the little intramural um, basketball. But when he got to middle school, all of a sudden he just shot up. Out of nowhere, he was an average height guy, and we had a tree out in the front yard that had grown up, and, and he, his head was almost under the bottom of the tree. And we actually took a picture of that. I have to remember that when he was in high school. And so being a feeder school, the middle school coach told the high school coach, you may have a prospect to be on your JV, a young man we have here. And he just grew and accelerated and grew and accelerated in the sport and just became dedicated to his craft. On one occasion, he was getting ready to shoot free throws. And when he was standing at the line, bending over, he turned his head to see where we were. And I nodded at him and he smiled and went ahead and made the shots always looking for us. He was always family oriented. He would, even though he lived on campus, he would come home whistling and throw his keys in the chair, you know, and, and the kids would be so happy. They would just be all over him, just be all over him. They loved him so. But um, that's the main memory I have. And just the memory of, um, being out on that floor, him playing. See, I had no idea that Len could go from high school to college and, you know, get a scholarship. And my husband had explained to me, you see Bernard King, he and his brother? Yeah, well, Len can get a scholarship. I said, for real? And play like that? He said, yeah. See, I, I didn't know anything. And so he explained it to me, and then Len went ahead and uh, decided to attend the University of Maryland, and it was like a dream for me to go out there and see him play and to see him excel in his craft the way he did and how he just, he, uh, he came home one day and stood in the, at the back door and said, Mom, you see that? I said, what? I didn't know what it was. They call it a six pack now. But he said, take your fist and hit me in my stomach as hard as you can. I said, boy, get out of my face. Nobody thinking about you hitting you. I'll tear your stomach up. And he said, Mom, <laughs> laughing, Mom, for real, hit me in my stomach. And I took my fist and hit him as hard as I could. It was like a brick wall. He, and he laughed. I told you. I told you you couldn't hurt me. But, he, you know, he was chiseled. He really was. And that, he was chiseled when chiseled wasn't even the thing. You know, he just took pride. His dad was an athlete, too, and built like that. You see what I'm saying? Not that tall. But... Um, he, um, he, he took good care of himself. For the number two pick in the first round of the 86 draft, and here's the commissioner, David Stern. The Boston Celtics select Len Bias of the University of Maryland. There he is, Len Bias. My husband went to the draft with Len. He flew up with Len. The other three children were at home with me. And Len was telling us this restaurant that someone wanted us to come to and look at the NBA draft. And we drove all up and down Route 1. I don't know. I forgot the name of it. Trying to find a place to see the draft, the restaurant. 
But eventually we got home and we saw it and it was all so beautiful, but yet it was... Um, Len Bias who had a great career at Maryland. It was like it was a dream. For me, it was like, is this really happening? Is this really true? Is this really going to be fulfilled? Will this, all of this take place? And that night they came home from the NBA draft and, and um, I wasn't there. I was at a meeting. And I said, I'll see him the next day. And the next day they called me 6.30 in the morning to tell me to come to the hospital to see him. So I never saw him after he returned from the draft until I got to the hospital and he was on the gurney. Let me say this, <laughs> I was um, naive about drugs. We were living in our nice little suburban home. I told you we had a nice little community. Everybody had their children. Everybody's children were growing up together and, and it was so wonderful and all of that. And you weren't thinking about drugs. And Nancy Reagan had started her um, just say no program. Now, when she started her just say no program, I said, oh, that's cute. That, that's nice, just say no to drugs. But it wasn't until Len died of a drug-related death that I was kicked out of my comfortable position to maximize my potential and see what was really happening. Well, after Len's death, I never will forget, he was telling me I should listen to this song. Ma, you need, I was, I'm a woman of faith. I'm a woman of faith. And so <laughs> he said, Ma, you need to hear this song by Whitney Houston, The Greatest Love of All. You need to hear it. You need to hear it. And uh, me, holier than thou, no, 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 I don't want, Ma, you need to hear it. Oh, I love her, I love her, I'm gonna marry her, Mom. Whitney Houston, Whitney Houston, and Whitney Houston. And I didn't pay him any attention about the song. So, his death kicked me out of my comfortable position and as I was saying, oh, Nancy Reagan is doing so good. Just say no to drugs. I was kicked right in the middle of it. And I believe a God-given mission to go forth when Len died. And when he died, the message that I bought to the youth of wherever I spoke was her song, The Greatest Love of All. He was telling me <laughs> what to say to the kids because he was gonna be a seed that go down in the ground to bring forth life. So you go on with that, everybody is tore up, everybody is crying. Pe people still come up to me today with tears in their eyes. The Uber person that bought me here said, um, uh, oh, your name is Lanice. I said, mm-hmm. She said, my daughter's name is Lanice. I said, oh, okay. And she said, the only other Lanice I know is Lanice Bias. And I said, that's me. She said, what? <laughs> she, she said, I went to school with Len. We went to Northwestern together. I know Jay, I know Michelle. I mean, that's just the way the world is. But people today still get full when they think about Len because the story was never finished. And that's bad enough. And then 42 months later, Jay is murdered. And I was so upset with God. I said, now here I am standing on one son's grave burying another. And I said, I would serve you and you promised me pearls, 
and all I have in my hand are dead leaves, my two sons dead. And so my faith brought me through, still bringing me through, still bringing my family through. It's something that you never get over, you just learn to live with. Because the deep grief that I'm sure my daughter, my remaining son, and my husband, I, I can't say they're like me because everybody's walk is different. My walk dip is, is different from theirs spiritually, and everybody has their own way of coping. But, as my husband says all the time, we circle the wagons. That's all we know is to circle the wagons, and that's what we do, and we come back together and keep it moving.